LLC, Pest Geek Podcast, Living the Wildlife Podcast, Stephen M. Van Tassel, or their or his affiliates are not responsible for followers' use of the information provided here. Hi everyone, Stephen Van Tassel here, wildlife control consultant, bringing you another episode of Living the Wildlife as part of the Pest Geek Podcast family. Glad to have you on board. I hope you've had a great week. Uh, I've certainly had a busy early February, late January was when I'm recording some of this material, so uh, it has certainly been tough for me. I trust that you've had a great week yourself. Do take a few moments, if you would, and subscribe to the channel. You can just sort of ring the bell as well as to make sure that you're going to be getting uh, future updates of our podcast. Those of you that don't want to use YouTube, you can also visit me on Rumble. Just go to Wildlife Control Consultant, and it'll be my podcast will be located there as well. You can also drop me a line, if you would, at wildlifecontrolconsultant at gmail.com, wildlifecontrolconsultant at gmail.com. Mail.com. Love to hear from you, your trials, questions, and uh, I'll res- respond back to you or talk to you, talk about some of the issues on the show. And of course, you can also uh, suggest topics for the show, or you, perhaps you want to be on the show yourself. I'd love to hear from you. So again, that's wildlife control consultant at gmail.com. So this week we are continuing our, our just lengthy interview with Dr. Neem Quinn. She is a professor. Let me get the title out here, Human Wildlife Interaction Advisor at the University of California uh, Co- Cooperative Extension, and she's in the uh, in the LA area. She actually does more than just LA County, so she does more than that, but her job is involved in handling those conflicts down there, and so she is becoming a leading researcher in the area of rodent control, as you well know, uh, if you've been listening to the podcast California, of course, has enacted some of the most strictest rodenticide bans in the country. In other words, only people can only use uh, second gens, for instance. Uh, it has to be a professional and under certain circumstances, and they only allow second gens in, in like agricultural situations in limited circumstances. Very restrictive, very challenging, and a lot of this attitude, of course, is spreading across the country. Right now, we're in the midst of the EPA's uh, preliminary uh, decision, uh, PID, preliminary uh, impact decision. I forgot what the I meant, though, but they're making some major changes to rodenticide labels. Proposed interim decision. There it is. Proposed interim decision for rodenticides. And that uh, is coming up here on February 13th. And those, that's the deadline. And the people don't make that deadline. That was the last period of comment. It is not, I don't think it's going to be likely that the comment period is going to continue. They've kind of denied that. But there may be extended comments perhaps with the wealth. I When I uploaded my comments, uh, there was, I think, 1700 already at this point we're not even at monday yet so this is i'm on thursday prior so february uh february 9th is when i'm recording this so uh it's going to be interesting to see how that plays out but dr quinn will be talking in this particular segment this is part two Uh, there's going to be at least a part three so if you haven't listened so far i would encourage you to go back to the previous podcast get this get the situation because this goes on for almost two hours uh and so we've been breaking it up into chunks so the first half hour is of course part one we're now dealing with part two which is about another half hour of my interview with her and so the topics that she's talking about of course are trapping in the west coast rodent academy which is something that she has been involved in it's probably by the time you hear this it's probably are going to be filled but don't uh don't don't cry or don't uh, don't mourn because she also has another one coming up in November for those of you that want to attend that. So you definitely want to check that out. And then she's talking about some interesting research that she's done into the area of isotopes. This is where they can actually track the rodenticide from a specific spot and whether it's getting into the specific animal. And so they're able to trace this through multiple levels of uh, 
troph troph multiple trophic levels is the word I'm looking for. For example, so if you, if you have a rodenticide with this isotope, you're able to then, okay, the rat eats it, then the coyote eats the rat, the ro coyote gets killed by a mountain lion, and you can track where that rodenticide goes and know exactly where it was. And so they're doing some of this research and they're even able to find this isotope, of course, in feces. And so they're doing feces surveys. It's remarkable information. And so, because we're gonna find out, she's gonna ultimately find out where these rodenticides are. Are they coming from bait stations or are they coming from somewhere else? And she's proposing that various pesticide manufacturers have to do this type of testing to see where their rodenticides are going into the environment. Very interesting stuff. It could really answer a lot of questions. Unfortunately, like all things, it's not cheap. So I'm glad you're here. Stay tuned. Dr. Neem Quinn, again, she's Human Wildlife Interaction Advisor from the University of California Cooperative Extension. Here, here we go. I think the difference for, and I can see that with certain pest control companies because there's so much emphasis on production. They also make more money, but in the wildlife control field, if where we often don't have access to the rodenticides because mm -hmm. many many wildlife control operators don't have a pest control license, and for the animals they control, there is no pesticide legal anyway, so it doesn't yeah. matter. Uh, but they will. If there's something about trappers, as it were, although wildlife control is more than just trapping, there's an, you, you're always tweaking and you're, you have to spend the time because trapping in and of itself is so time intensive that you have to sp spend a little bit more time. You can't just simply drop your bait station every yeah. 15 feet. You just, you just can't. Um, and I, and it, I think that happens with rats too. I just don't think we know how to do it. And it's funny. Yeah. I feel like trapping is definitely a science yeah. But I don't think that any trappers have ever, like, or any scientists have ever worked with any trappers to figure it out. But I know from our coyote work, like, when I'm working with our trappers, like, I can see them. Like, I could, I just know we're going to be successful because yeah. I just, yeah. I can feel their energy mm -hmm. from the trap set, right? Yeah. I just, and it's so funny. I remember one of the, like, it was a couple of months ago, we were out with our trapper um, it's a county trapper in LA and um, we're in a flood control basin and you know it had rained a bit but not then like we wouldn't like we don't we can't really trap when it rains okay. because like we're under a lot of different constraints as scientists like ethical constraints and like right. we really don't want our, our, our coyotes to get out you know out from like and especially we trap in a lot of debris basins so like they're they're more wet um, than your kind of your typical trapping sites sometimes and so but it had been wet it dried up and and our trapper um a guy that called Burgos was like oh these coyotes are massive and I was like nah it's been raining like but he's like we're definitely going to catch that big one I was like nah you know like I mean I don't know Stephen like and that's why I work with trappers because I'm not stupid enough to think that I can do it myself George I, I nearly swore there but sure enough we this and like 38 pounds is a big coyote for California like that's a big <sighs> western coyote yeah this thing was massive, like absolutely giant. That's one of the big, biggest coyotes we've ever recovered. Never mind, it is the biggest coyote we've ever caught. Wow, but like, it's funny. Pounds. It's it's like I think it's science because mm -hmm. like I, but like I think for a trapper, it's like intuition, right? But if you yeah. have that, but if you make those observations over and over and over and over and over again, that is science. And so, it is. yeah. But I think that it's the same for the bait station. I think that as a trapper, you would never plop down a, like your trap, like ever. You're like. You know, there's like so many different things, like what time of year is it? Like, are they more interested in like, a, and I don't know all the, the different terms for the sense, but like some of them are more like territorial type yep. Yep. ones. Some of them are a little bit more like food based. Yeah. So you have, you have food, <laughs> curiosity, you have uh, like the pheromone type type lures that are out yeah. there. So and we yeah. have all that for insects and stuff yeah. as well. What do we have for rodents? Absolutely nothing. <laughs> Well, you know, that's an interesting thing because there's some products being marketed now. Uh, I know of one that's being marketed now that says it takes away the rodent fear. And uh, I was doing some literature work and I think I found a product, and, but I just have to play with it. But they're talking about some very micro, it's like a pheromone. Um, 
So I'd be interested in uh, interested to see if that's true. But you know, there's a lot of chem- lure lure making and in, in and trapping is sort of like the alchemy of chemistry. There's a lot of mystique with it, and the magic goal is trying to find that lure that's going to just pull them in. But the reality is, location is always best. It's always number one, and uh, the the lure just brings them the last few few feet or it may help them overcome some fear basically uh but at least that's but we haven't had the kind of research on some of these baits i would like to see uh, because again it's so time consuming and expensive and it is it's difficult to it's difficult to work in a managed system as well right so like it's really hard to like be like if you're thinking about trying to find like a control site so as like a, a scientist like it's really important to have like the nothing, right? The no management, the coyotes that are not exposed to rodenticide. Right, right. Those places, those things don't really exist. And so right. it does make it more difficult as well. So um yeah, yeah it was it's it, I mean it's a good challenge and it's sometimes and then some days you're just like, oh Jesus, what did I get myself into? Like yeah. it's, just, it's just difficult. So, so you've we let's try to transition so you've done a lot of rodent work now uh and you're doing more so that's that's coming you have your rodent academy coming up soon that's coming up in march it's almost full probably by the time people hear this it will be full uh talk a little bit about that for people to sort of think about if they wanted to come and attend that in the future yeah, well, it's called the West Coast Rodent Academy, and and certainly there are other rodent academies out there. So just don't think that the one in California is the only one. I mean, I think it's the best one. Obviously. Sure. But, uh, yeah. There's you know there's ones in Texas and New Orleans, and there's ones in Arizona, and and I think there's developments to get some in other states as well. Um, and and obviously there's the original Rodent Academy by Bobby Corrigan in right. in New York. In New York, um, that's right. And so our our Rodent Academy is held twice a year, generally in March and in November. Um, okay. And it's a three day event and, and it's chocker block. Like there's a lot going on in there. And we talk about a lot of things, you know, it's it's really we kind of start at the start with like rodent biology, behavior, ID, which are kind of like the building blocks to any rodent management program. Mm-hmm. And then we move into like disease and like it's more fa- like it's more about the PMP or the customers like what it's not about like random rodent diseases it's kind of the diseases that a PMP could be exposed to right, right. and right. it's funny because I ask at the start of every every rodent academy how many people have been exposed to a rodent disease and I'm generally the only one that puts up my hand so I always say do do as I say not do as I do um, right. because you can make very stupid decisions as a field biologist sometimes get, yeah we get care you're not the only one we get careless in the field yes yeah um, oh, and it doubt. can be very dangerous, you know, yeah. and a lot of a lot of people that are presenting with these unusual diseases are actually PMPs that are that are doing body wildlife body recovery in sub subspaces, things yeah. like that. Right. So we do that. And um, there's a huge focus on um, exclusion, which we've already talked about. It's mm-hmm. very, very important part of a program that I think that people often neglect. And I think that. You know, I think that what's great about exclusion is, is that exclusion for a mouse and exclusion for a possum, it's the same, it's almost the same thing, right? right? It's just about the general tools that you need. And so um, the guy that leads our um, exclusion breakout, it's all hands-on and we have a number of hands-on things as well. So it's not just classroom learning, like we get people out so they can get their hands dirty and just you know not just sitting on their backsides all day like it can it can get very boring yeah um to be listening to and it's not all it's not all science driven so it's not just me standing up there it's peer-led as well right so if people from the industry and um, that have actually experience in the industry and um, now i can whack rats with the best of them for sure Stephen. but like it's not my job right my job is science but it's important right. to have people that are like understand the industry and I understand the industry too but I'm not in it right Right, right. and so so we work with a lot of different manufacturing partners our distribution partners you know we have people from um, different cities come in and talk about trapping talk about rodenticide and even we have things about talking to the media because what happens when you mess up Um, What happens when, you know, you get reported to a company or what happens when you have, you know, a rat fall out of a ceiling 
in a restaurant that you manage and like that happens all the time right. and people are companies are just not prepared for it right. or the pmp gets side like it, they get like ambushed when they're there on their service and so like we do even stuff like this and then like we actually make our pmps develop and sell us a rodent survey so they have to oh. use everything that they've learned um in the in the two in the in the first like two and a half days and in the the final day like they're split into groups and then they have to do we we develop like scenarios and it's funny because a lot of my scenarios are actually real scenarios that yeah, are based yep. on like friends or like situations that i've you know been involved in and then they're they have to talk about like you know they they have to and I, we're not really interested in price. Like we're just kind of interested in how they use the, the the information. Like what different? Like are they using new technologies? Are they thinking about how they use their rodenticides differently? Are they thinking about the health impacts of the job? Because maybe there's maybe one of the jobs isn't actually like a must job, like a house mouse job. Maybe it's actually paramiscus, right? Mm -hmm. And are they right. thinking about the health implications of things like that? Right. And then we have we actually have three prizes. We have um the innovators award so just a let someone that's just you don't even have to think that far out the box even if you have like a plan that encompasses everything or thinks a little bit different um we have um a technical award which i generally grill them and ask them the technical questions and if you get it wrong you don't win the prize right <laughs> but then one of my one of my favorites is is that we get our like someone from our administrative staff to come in who knows nothing about rodents right and she grills the she grills them. It's great. Like, and it's just like dealing with the customer, right? right. That knows nothing. Well, what about my cat? Or, or you know, what's right. I don't I don't want poison. Like I've heard that they get thirsty and they die in the walls or right. whatever, you know? And then yeah. they have to be able to react to that based on the scientific or like technical information that they've received. So like, I think it's really, I mean, I'm biased, but I do think it's really great. And we've, you know, we've collected a lot of information from surveys. You know, people learn a lot. People are able to use the tools that they we give them. Um, and then, you know, they make great links from, you know, industry as well. And, you know, we've had people, everybody from people that have literally never done a rodent job before. Like, it's day one. Right. The people that have been on the job for, like, 50 years. And they're still learning things. Do you have a manual? Is there a manual with it? So, we do. Yeah. And um, I don't know if everyone's, if you, anyone's ever been to um, Bobby Carrigan's Academy. But, like, I, I was, like, like, lifting weights by the time I was coming home on the plane. Yeah. Yeah. And so, like, we tried to, con to condense that down. Um, and like some of our, so like some of our stuff is on the, on the website and, and we are actually trying to condense it down even more. Like we want it to be something that you put in your glove box and then that you can pull out every so often if you have a question, but people don't use it that often. Like yeah. people, because like you're too busy, right? You're in the field and you're too busy. And like, then after you're done with your, like your Terry after your 350 bait stations in the you know, 95 degrees Southern California. Like the last thing you want to do is open a flipping manual to like yeah. see. What's going but what on. about those of us who like the get into the weeds? The weeds. Well, you will definitely be able to take your manual home with you if you ever, <laughs> if you ever attend. Stephen. So I had because I've been to Corrigan's twice. Yeah. Um, I was privileged to get out there to Corrigan's twice. But I, I think because when I was doing some research, I'm right now I'm revising Frischman's book on the vertebrate pest manual, and I'm narrowing it down just for commensals. I was disappointed with how hard it was to find the same kind of parallel information that we have on Norway rats. Like, you know, they'll have, you know, how far can a Norway rat fall and survive, right? They have yeah. a, where people were just tossing, I don't know, watching, tossing animals out or having them jump. And it was interesting to see how we don't have the same level of data for because roof rate because you like to kind of put them in a parallel line you know like you know what's their birth rate how many times and it's like we don't know we don't know like what do you mean we don't know we do um know. and we don't I mean, know and i'm like how you, is this possible you you knew rex baker right from yeah. have you met rex from cal poly pomona yeah. i'm like rex which you know i think i have these great ideas and i would go to rex who has obviously mm -hmm. since passed on and i would go to rex and i go hey rex i have this great idea and he's like oh yeah we did that like, but like he never had time to publish it because he was very focused on his teaching as well. Yeah. And so, yeah. and then his house went on fire and everything that he could have published went on fire. Oh, and, no, no. And so, Gosh. 
like um like i'd say like rex's files have like so much information but what's interesting is is that even though rex was based in southern california what was all his research on well he did things on pocket go i have a stuff on but pocket go for his rat his rat focus research was all nori rats and part of it was because in some of the like there was like duck farms and like things like that that did have a lot of nori rats back in the day but they're all gone and along with them the nori rats have essentially vanished from from orange county at least and so they've been filled in by roof rats yeah because because there's no trash and that's like like that's it goes back to my hypothesis why are there no norway rats in orange county because there's nothing for them to eat yeah so that's a fascinating well i'll be interested in how that explores explores out so if uh people want to have the rodent academy in their own state is there a program that would they could uh either import you folks to go lead the class or is this something where you would have like the materials and you would say here's go and go forth and do your thing or is it how does how would someone how would that work for them we would uh, we would be delighted i'm not saying that i'm going to have all the time to travel to whatever right. 50 states um and it's interesting like we have someone coming to the rodent academy for their second time from alaska um which is interesting but we would we would love to have that conversation with with you know like if it's uh like a state association you know like your state like association for um pest management whether it's an academic that's in cooperative extension or even not in a land grant university i would be so happy to like discuss our model um and like i think like if like just for example like they wanted to host a, a rodent academy in montana i'd be like well i know this guy called stephen van tassel that knows a lot about ro- <laughs> but you know what i mean like sometimes yeah. it's the connection is missing sure. yeah right so, so that's all that's all available well, that's something for people because there are some most of our industry has just small businesses often one person operations but there are some that are getting larger and they will actually sometimes host a training event and bring in other corporations and have, you know, 20 or 30 people and that sort of, so definitely we'll, uh, we'll provide that information again. It's Dr. Neem Quinn out of the uh, university of California cooperative extension. She is on the web. So she's not that hard to find. How about we transition over into coyotes? Are you doing anything more with coyotes? Yes, we are. But coyotes, are, the reason I study coyotes is because of rats, right? So I am not, you study coyotes because of rats? Well, it's because of rodenticides, right? Oh, right, right, right. right. Okay, all right, and okay. And so I think that people that that work with coyotes are absolutely flipping crazy, um, Stephen. <laughs> like, I just, I can't believe that, A, people do it for fun, and P, people do, do it for money. Um, and, like, I'm, like, you know, like, I'm obviously not from a place that has coyotes, right? And so I'm all, like, naive and, like, right. I'm a fairly positive person, but trapping coyotes will stamp that positivity out. Of you. <laughs> <laughs> how, and how are you trapping them? Are you using cage, cages? No, no, we're not that bad. Okay, okay we're not well, that bad. So we do mostly we use the collarum, and um, okay. because right. we like, I can't catch a non-target. Right? There's a, so many implications for me if we catch a non-target. Oh, so, got you. All right for Iacuck. That for those of you who are listening, uh, Institutional Animal Care and Use Committee is the governing body that manages. Uh, animal research in the university and so researchers as as neem quinn is is obligated to follow the guidelines of this institutional animal care and use committee having been through it it is um you yeah i'm so glad in the state i don't have to fuss with it so there's a lot of swear words generally that are incorporated with discussions with iacock that we yes have, it's we uh here. it's it gotten is, worse it's, it's one of the reasons why people don't go into wildlife research it, is because it's such a pain i don't think that i think it's a necessary step like i think we should be do, like especially if death's an end point like we shouldn't be killing more things than we need to but when yeah. it comes to rats, it's frustrating because people are out there every day doing it. And here we right. are trying to do it. As no, I, I totally agree. There, it, Sometimes there's been some research where we're just repeating the same thing over and over again, hoping for a different result. And that gets a little useless. But, it, but the problem is, is that when you're doing lethal research, they, they like... Oh, they hate it. Getting they're getting on your nerves in some place. A lot of the universities won't even allow it anymore. No. And so it's like, so, well, what what's the point? So our isotopically labeled bait, which is is is, you know, and we've talked about it before on, on the podcast where like we're trying to develop this bait 
and we're not trying anymore. We've been successful, right? We're trying to develop this this bait that we can we can trace up multiple trophic levels. So like if a rat eats it, we know, but then if a coyote eats that rat, then we know. And we've never, we've never had that before. We've never right. had a tool that we can trace through multiple levels. We've had tools where we can trace through one level, right? Yeah. Yeah. Like different things. We have this tool now and and this project has been a nightmare and it actually, the nightmare started with Aya Cook, right? That right. we had like, you know, they were really unhappy that we were, we had to kill all the rats because we had to be able to feed the rats to yeah. the coyotes. Yeah. Now we didn't kill any coyotes. That was a whole other, that was another Aya Cook journey, right? But you we weren't doing kill- your study on the rats, were you? No, we weren't, but we still needed Iacook approval to kill the rats because they were a part of the study. Oh, right, yeah, and right, so right. I needed Iacook approval to kill the rats. Then I needed oh, separate Iacook approval to feed the rats to the coyotes. And right. then I needed more approval to do a, our pilot study, which is what we we're in now. And so <laughs> what we were trying to do is we were trying to develop this bait. And like the reason why we're trying to develop this bait is because, and it's, I mean, I had this like whole succession plan of really what we wanted to achieve and like what we wanted to achieve is to provide governing agencies with a tool to get research driven mitigation measures yeah, or to right, be able to right. test the success you could prove it. Yeah. of mitigation measures. Yeah. And we have that tool now. Granted, we've only we've proven that it works in a controlled situation, mm-hmm. um, but we haven't proven that it, it, we can do it in a field. And now I, I think because it works in the in the in the control situation it doesn't actually m- matter that we like our we have this very small pilot study yeah. um mainly because our our tool is ridiculously expensive yeah like ridiculously yeah. expensive but i think it's totally worth it it works really well we can detect it we've developed methods to detect rodenticide in fur and in feces oh um, so you can do a hair capture study then you can just so we, do hair, was, hair snares that's what we wanted to do is we wanted to do hair snares but what we figured out in the process is that you'd have to literally brazilian wax your animal <laughs> to get enough hair <laughs> for it to work but 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 we <laughs> but we know that like just say and like this happens all the time for like just say like we have people in the northwest that are have done fisher work and they've recovered just like pelts of mm-hmm. animals, right. like you could actually test them for rodenticide exposure okay. now, right? You could a, a scavenged animal. You could also test. Now, is that a good thing or a bad thing? I'm not really sure, but it's. Oh, it's I think that's ex- a good thing. Absolutely, yeah, it's an extra tool, right? And it's like it, it increases your sample size and increases mm-hmm. the sample of the things that you are able to do. So, like, we, I was just really excited. Now, what we so what we're doing now for our coyote work is we are trying to trace rodenticide exposure in live carnivores which has never been done before right all oh. rodenticide researchers do is they scrape dead stuff off the road right right, right. and like you're already dead right? right and so have you lived with your rodent exposure rodenticide exposure have you right. been exposed multiple times like yeah. where have you been exposed so right. you have this great student that basically walks miles and miles and miles several times a week and she goes to like the areas where these collared coyotes are and she's a poo picker upper that's you know and she picks up fresh scat and okay. so what we do is and like people are probably going to start rolling their eyes because like this is just ridiculous science right so we yeah. we split the poo in half mm-hmm. half goes to one lab and i don't know if you know this but probably most of your listeners don't know this but when you poo yeah. you cover your feces with a layer of epi- your own epithelial cells so like your okay. own skin covers your right. Ooh, everybody so you, you right? dna yeah. it as well then yeah so we dna okay. it so we know if it actually came from one of the coyotes uh, that we captured nice and then the other half so that half goes to uc davis and then the other half goes to nwrc in fort collins in colorado and then they have developed the methods to test not just for anticoagulant rodenticides also for cholecalciferol also for bromethylene really so yeah so it's nice I mean, super excited and you know you said about like funding earlier you know we got a huge injection of funding from the anticoagulant rodenticide task force for this okay. project as All well right. they're putting their money where their mouth is yeah All and right. you know this was this project was also funded by the california department of pesticide regulation as well okay um and you know it's just so important to be able to monitor rodenticide exposure in live animals so like yeah. it's kind yeah. of like you know we kind of had this big hairy audacious goal essentially where like you know, we, we it started with the isotopically labeled, um, pr- like bait, 
But like it kind of expanded to wait, we don't even need the isotopically labeled bait to just monitor it in general. Yeah. Now, it would be great if we have mitigation measures that are saying, hey, you can't broadcast, but you can use bait stations. Well, yeah. how do you know which one's better? How do you like right. there's no measure, but like with an isotopically labeled bait, like in a situ in a in a in a situation that's already saturated with rodenticide, right? Which I yeah. think is almost all ag and urban situations now. That oh, yeah, I think this is what I struggle with. I mean, you're really on the this is what I when you know, in terms of the EPA's preliminary interim decision, right? They're really cracking down. They want to crack down on broadcast use and spot based spot use, especially around recreational areas, golf courses, and those types of things. I haven't really seen that in the ag, some of the ag areas or the, like rangeland and things like that. It seems like we're still going to be able to use it there, but they, it seems like they want everything to go to bait stations. I'm not convinced that bait stations are by definition safer than doing spot baiting and well, or a, a broadcast. You, know you know why they feel safer is because nobody will use them, right? I mean, it's just well, like that, I, I don't want to say that the EPA wants to, you know, ban it all. I think that's kind of what we're doing. My motto is if something works, we ban it. If it works great, we ban it faster. Yeah. Uh, like, look, I think I'm wondering if we should go back to 1080 and simply let producers control the species and have one treatment and be done with it for a while and have something real rather than having to keep going out and trying to control the stuff that's not working. I just, this whole like stabbing, like there is a problem, right? I mean, I don't know exactly the extent of the problem. I mean, I, like, is it, is exposure a problem or is intoxication a problem, right? Because right, that's right, totally right. different, right? It and is, I think right. that's, that's kind of what we're we're facing in California. Like we're even going to the point where we think that Southern California coyotes are not as susceptible to rodenticide. And so like we're starting to do like genomic like research to see if that's true. Right. Um, because 99% of our sample is exposed to anticoagulant rodenticide. Yeah, because we don't know what that real level is, of effect is. We don't know what the level, the lowest level of effect is for a coyote. When, well, what... How much exposure do they need to get before there's negative effect? It's going to be different for different species, right? Well, I always say that this is the way, this is the example I always use. And I always pick on the poor guy that sat in the front row of my talk, right? <laughs> right. So I, like, I'm an Irish woman. Um, and yeah. now I actually don't drink. I'm, I'm a, t a terrible example of an Irish woman. But just say I, right. I went in my day when I did drink a lot, yeah. when I, um, I used to play rugby and had a liver like a cement mixer, essentially. <laughs> um, <laughs> we, we, I, I could drink 10 pints, right? I bring an American with me and they drink 10 pints, right? Yeah. We, we, I wake up in the morning and I'm hungover. That's a sublethal effect. The right. American does not wake up in the morning. That's, that's right. a lethal effect, He's right? Dead. right? Right, right. <laughs> right. And that's, it's the same toxicant, mm -hmm. the same species, and totally different reaction to the same thing. And like, right. it's even interesting. Like, if you think like, like a coyote versus a mountain lion. Like coyotes don't have to work that hard to get their food, right? And if so, if they're exposed to rodenticide and, you know, we're all busting capillaries, like even just sitting here and not really moving that much, mm -hmm. but like they're clotting themselves. Yeah. You think of a coyote, right? They don't really have to work that hard to get their food. However, a mountain lion, it, it's like literally like a roller coaster to get a meal, right? Mm. And so like the effect of rodenticide could even between the species could be much worse on certain species than right. something like it because of things like that. You know, they may be more susceptible because of life history stuff. And I just it's really complicated and it's not very black and white. And I right. feel like EPA have completely missed the point. Um, like I think that there's there's mitigation measures needed, but it's like this right yeah. they're like yeah. it's just or like they're reaching into a bag and being like whoa this is a good idea let's try this one well i'm sure the lawsuits didn't help because they're trying no. to they're flail around you know is sometimes lawsuits are a blunt instrument right so it's mm -hmm. which i don't i don't do, know they have to do something but there's like the, my, my point is now is that we have a tool and and they should like they don't have to come to me to use it i don't right. care right? right we have we right. will have this published eventually and they like people should be like manufacturers should be forced to use it, right? Yeah. Right. And um, yes, it's expensive. It's not cheap. Most things aren't cheap, even. And so it's not ideal. And like it, it took us a lot of troubleshooting to manufacture it. 
I like I seriously I barely even knew what an isotope was when I started Stephen mm. and we like we had all these crazy ideas that we were literally going to mix it in a bowl in the lab well no <laughs> that's not how it happened right it's way more complicated than that right. um, you know and like our like our our like our isotope was made by someone and then yeah. it got sent to France and then it came back to Milwaukee and Jeez. then it got now it's in then it was in Fort Collins and then it was yeah. in Logan and wow. and like Wow. Well, that's been the end of part two of my interview with Dr. Neem Quinn of the University of California Cooperative Extension. She is the Human Wildlife Interactions Advisor located around uh, L.A. and the counties surrounding L.A. as well. I hope you've enjoyed this. We're really getting into some weeds here. I think you're going to find some, it's interesting, you're going to get a glimpse of some future technology that's going to be used in the area of rodent control and some of the complex questions that maybe your clients are going to have. So I hope you enjoyed this, but stay tuned. There's going to be more. We have part three coming up next week and perhaps part four. It depends on how I divide up those la that last hour of our conversation. You've been listening to Living the Wildlife Podcast. Definitely reach out to me, if you would, at wildlifecontrolconsultant at gmail.com. Wildlifecontrolconsultant at gmail.com. Would love to hear from you. Thoughts, suggestions for new shows, perhaps you know someone or a company that wants to be on the show we'd love to have them. love to talk to them about the possibility of being on the show uh, we have a very broad audience here and anything related to vertebrate pest control as well as the business side i'm all ears would love to have you to give that information out to the public again that's wildlife control consultant at gmail.com we'll also please subscribe to the channel whether you do it here on youtube or go over to rumble and subscribe there would be glad to have you i'd really appreciate your support and lastly again this is living the wildlife why do we call it living the wildlife because we want you to live the wildlife not be the wildlife take care everyone and stay tuned for next week for part three thanks for watching